Hey, welcome to the Rocks Life podcast. I'm Greg, and today's interview is with George Edwards. George is one of the UK High Rocks master trainers. He's a very experienced personal trainer, and in this chat, we talk about his thoughts on High Rocks, some of his training principles, uh, how he's coping with training around his calf injury now, which is obviously stopping him from running, and lots more. Uh, George is also good friends and business partners with the elite High Rocks athletes Tom Hogan and Hunter McIntyre and we get into some of the qualities that he sees in the two of them that perhaps separate them from other athletes. It's a really good discussion that I think will be helpful and interesting whatever level you're at. Also, I'll just add that we didn't get into a ton of George's uh, sporting background uh, but if you want to hear more on that, it is very interesting and was covered really well in the interview that George had with Ian Kay over on the UK HXR Fitness Racing Podcast. So check that out once you've given this one a listen. Uh, I think that's everything for now. I hope you enjoy it. Can we just give a one minute brief overview of your of your history, your sporting background, how you get to this point and then, and then we'll go from there? Yeah, sure. Um, so started off my athletic career, sort of cross country and football background. Um, played at a decent level. Um, got into coaching uh, after university. Went off to the states. Um, still trying to make it as a pro out there. Didn't, <laughs> um, done, but um, was definitely galvanised by the fitness and the approach in American coaching. Um, came back to the UK and sort of got into like OCR Spartan racing. And noticed it was full of cross country runners. <laughs> and then when High Rocks came along, I was like, ah, oh, kind of somewhere, you know, a little, little bit more might suit me, a little bit stronger, not quite as long, you know, sort of a middle ground. So, um, yeah, it was actually Jesse and Luke um, from Spartan that asked me to go to Germany just before the, um, like, yeah, January or February 2020. So we flew off to Hanover uh, with Jade and we did a, um, the high rocks out there and we all kind of just suffered together basically it was uh it was quite miserable after everyone was sore and you know you know that particular feeling after a high rocks where your legs don't work properly so we kind of uh we sort of looked at each other and was like right if this is going to come to the uk and this is going to you know bow up then we need to start training for it appropriately so yeah. so yeah the first one's always a shock to the system right yeah, I think so. It depends. Like, obviously, different people were having like different training protocols before it. You know, some people were just like fly into it with like three, four weeks' notice. Other people were having like a longer five, six month run up. And I think the first one is invaluable because you just need to get something on the board and kind of see where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I think if you overtrain for it for a period of time, the mind kind of plays tricks on you and you build it up to something bigger than it is if you don't perform how you think you are. So, uh, yeah, there's different approaches, but I think, yeah, if you've got a base level of fitness, you've been going to the gym for a while, six to eight weeks, throw something on the board, and then you can adjust accordingly. You know, either get a coach or, you know, look at your data and see what you need to work on, whether it's your conditioning, whether it's your strength, whether it's your transitions, whether it's your mindset or just preparation. You know, I've had trouble with, you know, nutrition and preparation going to some of the races where you have to travel. I always find that quite hard. You know, like when I put my athlete head on, I'm, you know, it's you know traveling the hotel and getting food at the right time and meal prepping. I find that stuff really tricky just because it's always a constant change. Whereas if there's a home race, you know, much like a home football match, you can just kind of go, right, sleep in your own bed, got my own breakfast, know where I'm going and you can sort of try, you know, you just reduce the variables. So, yeah. yeah. So if we, so you, it was a, uh... Hanover was it that first event yeah okay yeah. all right so did you know instantly like did you think this is this is gonna blow up yeah like as I saw it because Hanover's um I think it's gonna be a little bit like Olympia they have like a mezzanine balcony around so you we went in there and there was probably like 1500 people watching you know maybe more and the middle was just full and I just looked at it and I was like this is unbelievable like I can't comprehend why all these people are here you know and then when you do one and you kind of see how efficient it works and all the rest of it I had no doubt in my mind it was going to blow up in the UK um and I was obviously ranting and raving about it to anybody when I first you know sort of came back and you know was talking about it but people didn't have a clue what I was talking about 
you know, every every crossfitter was telling me they don't like running and they can't run. And then every runner was telling me they don't lift weights and they don't want to lift weights. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, there's got to be a middle ground here, guys. Like, just trust me. So um, obviously, you know, we were at home for like a year and a half and that, and I converted uh, the garage gym into a pretty decent setup. And I hired uh, Ian Hosek, who's like an endurance coach out in the States. So I had him online programming me for, um, you know, the, the majority of lockdown, I'd say, because my I knew my weakness was like aerobic conditioning. You know, I was quite heavy and just I'd always struggled with the running in Spartan races. Never really struggled with any obstacles, to be honest, and you know any rig. And I knew I, it wasn't. It was going to be pretty similar with high rocks. But once you know, I'd be plenty strong enough for sleds. But like, can I handle that transition out of it? So Ian was pretty helpful, and he just got me you know, accountable going out there on a Sunday and plodding for an hour, hour and a half. And, you know, like I'm thankful to him. But then as I sort of looked at it, I was like, I need a change of intensity. And I was speaking to Hunter throughout lockdown as well. And I was doing a couple of his workouts and I was just seeing the difference in intensity and testing intensity. So it started to come together when um, I was sort of bench pressing in the morning, <laughs> doing split lunges. And then I was going off for like a two, three mile run in the evening. And I was like, wow, OK, this is a different level and um but yeah like it, it paid off and i got like a little age group win on the first one I, I got into the rock zone on the first race in london uh, about an hour and then i blew up on the warbles much to my dismay but um took about seven and a half minutes on the warbles so i need to sort of get back to that conditioning and sort of knock out one about four thirty, and then i might be looking at somewhere like 65 66 so that's the goal um whether it happens or not i just need to overcome this injury and get back to it so yeah yeah, cool. All right, if we just uh, what I've been asked quite a few times, like why I think it's blown up in the UK so much more than Germany or, or the US. What, what's what's your feelings with it? Um, I suppose the the fitness community in in London is very tight knit. It's very competitive, and and I think that is across multiple cities, Manchester, you know. Birmingham, like university towns as well, like Cardiff. And, you know, you're going to get people just, they're going to plug into their sports teams and their gym life. And I think it's kind of like the sport that people have been waiting for in a sense to kind of test their fitness. You know, like we are a, a culture, I'd say, of extremism in the sense that like we, we've we all got friends that live in the pub Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But we all know that one or two that like they don't go near it. They wake up, they do their runs. They, you know, they are training. They don't necessarily know what they're training for, but they just know it's an important part of their lifestyle and health. And I think it's just, you know, that perfect timing. Social media helps a lot of these things blow up, obviously, because social media it shows the best parts of our lives. And so it's something that people can really like. If you're a trainer, they drive their business from it. Um, if you're just kind of a, you know, a working dad or a working mum, then you can obviously show what you're made of as well. So that kind of like perfect timing, you know, is is one of the key key ingredients i'd say but mostly because it's a um you know it, it just requires hard work and dedication it's not necessarily a skill or a high level of skill right the wall balls are obviously the biggest skill component of it but the rest is more about like showing up accountability and doing what's required if you want to get better if you want to get a better time but it's something that anybody can rock up and try to do without too much overthinking of it you know there's no like it's not like a CrossFit competition where you've got to be worried about walking on your hands, you know? So it's simplified, you know? Yeah. And I think just every gym now has like open floor space where you can kind of build your own little gym. Like you roll a barbell over to the corner, you bring a ski erg over and then you're like, right, I've got a sandbag. So you can kind of make a mini high rocks in most like pure gyms and easy gyms. And obviously in, in London, there's a lot of fitness spaces that have been like that for a while. So I think I just think it was the timing. Yeah, you know? word spreads as well, right? Yeah, um, like, like you, you mentioned, like setting up in the gym, and like I know, like when I'm working out in the gym, and people like people look at you like you're mental at first, but then like they become curious, and it like it, it becomes like inspiring for them, and then they want to have a go, and like, then they tell their friends. You know, word just spreads quite quickly with it. I think. Yeah, um, that's so. it. And obviously, after like you know a year and a half at home, people are like desperate for experiences that are new they i think suddenly people realize that wow things can be taken away from me pretty quickly 
and maybe they're not in the best shape mentally or physically. And it sort of was like, you know, a bit of a galvanizing shot to maybe like, okay, this is a way to plug into a community, a lot of mental health struggles at the moment. And I think people need an outlet, you know, and we know that like, you know, going to the pub <laughs> isn't the best outlet long term. It doesn't really solve anything. But, you know, with people that you're kind of suffering with in a different way, training for this or, you know, throwing down a time in high rocks, you immediately can relate to somebody who's crossed the line in high rocks because you know how hard it is. There's no, at no point are you running around high rocks going, this is easy, you know? So when you cross the line, you have that bond with somebody. And I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, um, so you're a master trainer. Yep. Um, can you talk about what, 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 what bit, how that come about, what that means? Yeah. So you... basically I've been a, like a qualified PT and trainer since 2001, 2002. And yeah, I've worked with um, professional athletes and I've worked with disabled athletes and I've worked with you every day and every man person as well, trying to get their, trying to get their goals from kind of, you know, weight loss and, getting ready for bodybuilding competitions. So I've always been like a bit of a jack of all trades with a hybrid coach. So I guess the master trainer role came about when High Rocks were growing the brand and they wanted to come to the UK and they were looking for ambassadors and they were looking for a PT based in London. And yeah, the role just came up and I think they looked at my experience of being a trainer for 20 years and, you know, I, I understood the sport and I understood what was required to get better at it. And I've been training for it. So I think it was just one of those kind of like perfect storms. I know like there's probably like a few other coaches like <laughs> looking at it going, well, why is he the master trainer? And I get all that. And it's, you know, that's, you know, that's not really my problem. That's their problem. Um, you know, like I think when you work hard and, you know, you meet opportunities and I was lucky enough to get mine. But, you know, that's not to say sort of uh, there's, you know, one way to train for high rocks, you know, my way or the only way, not at all. Like, you know, um, they thought it was important as well to have like a female coach as well alongside. And Jade does a great job as well. And she knows her stuff and she's got bags of experience. So it kind of makes sense to have like a dual, you know, pronged attack when you're not only trying to increase like brand awareness and what the sport is, but also different like ways of training for it. So, you know, my background, I've done some ultra running, done marathon training you know i've got like a 315 marathon time with not much training to be honest it's not great it's not elite but it shows that i know what to do to get better and what to do to get faster for my own body and i've trained lots of people for marathons as well so i understood the aerobic conditioning aspects of it and then with the strength is quite specific to high rocks and when you understand the principles of strength and conditioning you can build your own block or cycle in training that allows people to like progressively overload and understand that, you know, although volume is king for professional athletes, when you're dealing with an amateur, you know, they've got, yeah, maybe they've got two young kids, full-time job, you know, more stress, you know, which is obviously exercise isn't always going to serve them the right way. So you need a coach that's going to sort of understand that, okay, how, you know, how can you optimize your week of training with what you've got and it may be lack of equipment it may be lack of time and so yeah you need to be flexible as a coach and I've just got that in experience I suppose so I think that's what's helped my clients and I think High Rocks recognize that as well and I guess you know there was a little bit of pressure about putting down a good time for myself um, you know as a sort of a, a veteran athlete now um, 40, <laughs> next, 40 next year Um that's you know, young, right? that's young. That's exactly, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't have that pedigree that Tom Hogan has. Tom used to run for, you know, Ireland. I believe he's got a 30, 30, 20, 10K tucked away in his locker and, and has an out the house 32 minute 10K. I mean, that's incredible. Um, I don't have that luxury. I stopped cross country um, it's pretty much as soon as I, I was allowed to <laughs> and um, went, went down the football path. But the football path taught me that kind of like, that interval method training and kind of like that ability to suffer, you know, and I was playing two or three games a week. So I always had a good, good base level fitness. And I think like most people that are career PTs, you become obsessed with a process and you could become obsessed with like 
how do you make this better? How do you optimize? And I think during lockdown as well, like I was able to test different avenues of how to improve, you know, I thought about the basically how do I fatigue my legs and then run a 5k. So, you know, thought about someone like maybe they'll have access to a sled, you know, or a ski erg. So I thought, well, if I, you know, if you just do some plyometrics or you do some, you know, static holds and then run your 5k, you're going to feel a difference and you're going to create a little overload there just because it's new stimulus, but it's not going to be so new that you can't get out of bed tomorrow. And just, I just was able to try and, you know, really hone in various methods that I use with a lot of my clients that are being introduced to this sport because the feeling when you come off the sleds is an unusual one when you start to try to run back to your previous pace. And, you know, there's a lot of tactics in it. And there's a lot of efficiency and, and high rocks isn't necessarily about just absolutely gunning it out the gate. You know, obviously the pros are, are very dialed into their, um, you know, their splits and stuff. And that's great, but the principles are the same. They need to know regardless of what happens, they can run at that threshold pace every lap. So they're very consistent with their times. And that's, you know, that's a smooth way to operate around a high rocks because then you're consistent. And if you're consistent in the high rocks, you'll have a good time. It's when you have like peaks and troughs with either your laps or one of the stations that you're really going to suffer because it's going to put you out of joint for the next station or the next lap. So it's just understanding that and helping people to prepare with, you know, their own, you know, skill set, their own, you know, genetics. You know, some people might have done high school athletics, which means they're maybe predisposed to fast twitch fibers. Most people played football or cricket. So they're kind of in that 90, 80 minute window. And, you know, it's just understanding what my client needs to sort of transition into high rocks. So, yeah, we test people at the beginning of a program and then we see based on their results and their capabilities and how much time they have to throw at their training, what we can do with them. And then it's about expectation and reality and kind of, you know, managing that. And I think high rocks understood that. And, um, yeah, it's been going really well. And it's the sports, obviously, blown up in the last year in the uk which is really exciting and they've got the double day in um in april which is which is a huge event and they've also got the go ruck affiliation coming out so there'll be um nutters including myself at one point i hope to do this in a, in a weighted vest um, is that is that so, coming to the yeah. uk is that it yeah i believe so yeah i believe there's okay. an affiliation um I, I mean it will be available i think at, at most races from next year um i'm not sure which one i'm not privy to that yet but i believe so there's going to be um yeah weighted vests um i think seven kilo and nine kilo or 15 or 20 pounds i forget the actual weights but i think it's similar to crossfit yeah okay just uh just on the topic of the master trainer uh, mm. so what what does that involve in terms of like your duties for high rocks are you training trainers as part of that or anything yeah, that's right. So we have um, like collaborations with the trainers. So we meet twice a year with various gym affiliates. And, you know, the first part is, you know, very simple and just making sure that everyone understands the movement standards and what's required. And then we talk about various ways to train for it. And then we discuss different workouts based on how you're going to teach a class this. Because essentially gym affiliates might have 20, 20 people coming to their CrossFit class or their... Um, their gym's class and they may only have four ski ergs you know they may only have two rowers so you've got to be adaptable so we're just showing people how you can incorporate all the various different energy systems in a session or in a week or in a month and how to train for it so it's just you know opening their eyes to okay what's required because the best thing about high rocks is the standardization it never changes which means your approach needs to be more scientific based and more data driven than say like an OCR, which one week it's flat, one week it's, you know, hilly, one week it's like lots of rigs together. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's ever changing and it's going to suit a different type of runner per week, which is great and exciting. But this is a different type of exciting because it allows the athlete to really dial in to like getting better. And so, you know, there's, it's going to probably highlight your lifestyle as well as your training because the preparation it takes to, perform and peak with your fitness and performance on a given hour and it could be as late as 8 30 in the evening on a saturday night that's a skill set 
you know, and how we peak as humans with our performance is, is much like it's hormonal, you know, it's not, you know, necessarily just with food and just with sleep. It's actually about managing hormones and how you deal with an athlete coming off various amounts of stress and how you deal with the load that's gradually changing. And I train a lot of my clients with like wave loading. So, you know, uh, classically people will deload once a, once a month, right. They'll do three weeks of training and maybe have a deload. And that may be fine for the experienced athlete. But if you talk to your client and they're on a new program, they're probably going to want another deload around week five or six, just because they're not used to of that going and going again and that progressive overload. And so it's my job to, you know, teach coaches as well about actually building that relationship with, you, with your client and understand what they're going through. And you'll get the most out of them and they'll get the most out of you. And then that allows you to open up, you know, about, nutrition hydration you know and actual like performance indicators you know and how to read measurements you know we've there's so much science out there in tech and wearable tech that people have but they don't know how to use so you might have a garment that's telling you like what your stride length is but if you don't know how to use it it's just like okay i've just paid 600 pounds for a watch i don't know what i'm doing with it so you need yeah. to understand heart rate zones performance indicators so that you can be like okay I'm feeling good this week and what can I expect when I, when I have a deload week? So yeah, I guess it's just my overall experience that I can bring to the table. Uh, it's not to say that I'm a better coach than someone that's not a master trainer. It's nothing to do with that. It's just about experience and timing. Yeah. Uh, I, I was going to ask you, is this a bit, bit later on, but seeing as you started talking about tapering and, and so on, do, do you feel like there's a, there's a limit to how many races someone should do in a season or, uh, yeah, or you know, picking your A and B races, anything like that. I'm seeing. I do these like race reviews on YouTube, and it seems like sometimes I'm saying the same names on the podiums every week at the moment. And uh, I think is that sustainable? So I'd be interested to see hear like your, your thoughts around that. Um, if you're talking about like the higher level, like you know, pro pro podium winners or pro or uh, podium chasers and they're in their mid twenties, it's probably sustainable in a way, because I look back to what I was doing in my twenties and I was playing a game of football on a Saturday and Sunday training three, four times a week and hitting the gym. You don't really get tired in your twenties, especially yeah, okay. if you're like, you live and breathe it. Um, now, I mean, I sort of we were speaking about earlier, but like the first time I did a high rocks, I've got doms. Now I really don't get them regardless because my training is all the same movements. I really have to put a new movement in there to create new stimulus to like feel the DOMS. It's much more like central nervous fatigue, which I'll get where you just kind of look at the gym and just don't fancy a workout to begin with. You just don't want to go near that intensity. And I think, you know, like Tim Vinich, you know, as a young kid, you know, who's got a great pedigree, great attitude. He kind of lives and breathes it, you know, like he doesn't really have a, have a ceiling. And then you look at someone like Tom, who's at the other end, you know, he's, mid 40s still got that like pedigree still got that drive full-time job responsibilities family business you know he has to probably that they, they would probably look at their seasons very differently mm -hmm. you know um i haven't actually spoken to tom about how he sees his seasons and, and, and his races but like i'd imagine tom will look at it and go okay that's the race i really want to do well for that's going to give me enough time to prepare for world championships and so forth and, and Tim will be thinking that as well, but I think that Tim won't be so worried about like, oh, if he wants to jump in and do a doubles with someone or if he wants to go after this or, or whatever. And so is it sustainable? It's, it's just different for different people. It's very individual. Um, if you take it down a notch and you go away from people that are doing like races for race sakes, they maybe let's say they sign up for Birmingham, London, Manchester, which is all within a three, four month window, right? I think I've seen it both both sides like i've seen people just go out and just do three pro category races in three months and they haven't got any better at any of them they've sort of like their first one was the best and they've sort of just got 30 seconds worse each time that spells out fatigue uh to me um and maybe they should take a break and look at it from fresh eyes um and you know i haven't raced since vegas so you know that's that's a long time and I'm excited to get back into it. 
but I know that with the injury that I've had, I have to kind of manage it and, and don't go all guns blazing. Otherwise, I'll be back sat here again. So yeah. you have to be patient, really, and you have to just understand that the more you race, the more stress you create, and that can have a knock-on effect if you're looking to peak a championship race or you know, or a particular type of race. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your injury. What what is your injury? Uh, as a grade two calf tear in the soleus. Um, so I did turf games. I was throwing away around some weights with some crossfitters and was having a great time. And then afterwards, I was like, right, I'm going to have a few days off before I sort of go back to running. Literally had four four days complete rest. And then I went for a run. And, um, you know, I did a little warm up and tried off. And it just felt like a Charlie horse. It felt like a little you know, dead leg or a spasm. And I was like, OK, I'll quit that. <laughs> I was in the middle of Hyde Park, so I had to get one of these e-bikes back to the gym. And even that didn't feel great. It kind of loosened up, and then I was getting a train two days later, and I literally hopped on the train. It just went, and uh, like it, it, it wasn't audible, but it felt like a tear. And then I rested it for a month, started to load it again. Same thing happened. I sort of was too aggressive with the loading, um, and then the third time I was really cautious with it, and again, probably. I went from like 1K, 2K, 2.5K, 3K of running, rested for a couple of days, then went back to 3K instead of going again. And I just, yeah, same thing happened. I just was on a sled with really light weight. I mo- I just moved a sled the day before, like 400 kilos, and I was like, great, I'm back. And then I was on a light sled with 20 kilos, and I was looking to move the sled quickly. So I was up on my toes a lot more. And, uh, yeah, I just felt it go again. And that was back in, I don't know, September so yeah this time I've been really cautious I've actually tried to forget about my own training for high rocks really it's not been easy I've spoken to Jay about it um really kind of try to switch off from it a bit and, and start again but um this time I hope that it's kind of all good fingers crossed and I can you know put down an eight week block of running before I enter a race so it could be Manchester if I'm lucky or Glasgow or maybe a European race but yeah I just have to get the load right this time because I don't really want to go up, go back to the drawing board for a third time. So I'm just being like probably overly cautious and it's much more psychosomatic this injury now because I don't really, I can do everything apart from running. So I don't really want to run, but it's such a large part of high rocks. I can't just be like, Oh, I'm going to just live on the ski erg and and the rowing machine and then just turn up and run, you know, nine kilometers on the day. It's not going to, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a good race. So yeah, I'm having treatment for it. Um, they've discovered it's a like compression of the tibial nerve that runs through the back of the calf and through the hamstring into the like L4, L5 in the lower back. So I have to like floss the nerve and kind of gradually create a little bit more um, balance, I guess. So it takes time. So it, it, in terms of training, like I know you've been like trying to forget about high rocks and that, but is it just more erg work that, that you're doing? Like if someone's watching this and they're injured and they want to train for high rocks, is it yeah. just like more, more erg work? That, that you yeah. Do? You, you can still use the right energy system. So like I'll do like one steady state conditioning. I'll sit on a Watt bike, sit on an erg per week, zone two stuff, 45 minutes, 60 minutes stuff, get a sweat. Um, immediately after though, I'll always try to pick up something heavy just for my own ego, to be honest. But I, I always feel better when I do a steady state. I'm sweating and I'm like, right, I'm just going to do a couple of sets of heavy squats or, a, you know, just pick up a bar and then just see like, okay, I can still do that. And then there's two sessions a week that are like mixed modality, CrossFit sessions. So I'll play with an Atlas Stone. I'll play with, you know, do some like barbell thrusters, um and i'll do like a lot of drop sets so i'll go from like heavy to light with various different exercises um and then there's like a session that's like how do i make the lunges and warbles harder that's like the goal how do i recreate that without the load of running the six seven kilometers before i get there so there's like intervals on the sprint um, on the on the watt bike into like heavy squats into like burpee broad jumps and then 
play with the lunges, heavier barbell front rack lunges or step ups, and then go a heavier wall ball into a lighter wall ball. So, you know, they become like five, six minutes, seven minute sets, you know, which really creates that, you know, that, that um, lactate threshold. But I still haven't run six, seven K. So I've actually reduced the load to train for it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I sort of work at it like that. Um, yeah, I, I just sort of monitor the times and the weights I'm moving so that I can just see what, you know, I do the following week. There's only really about, saying this to somebody, yeah, there's probably about 12 different workouts I do. You know, it's really simplified, but, you know, that's kind of how you get better because you can see performance indicators. So, you know. Do you feel like, um, I know it's never easy to say, do you feel like anything led to your injury? Like any anything you were doing wrong or anything like that in hindsight? Um, do you know what? It's probably just a bit of naivety in like uh, just going from like a big CrossFit competition to just thinking like, you know, I could just just try out the door. It's probably a bit of arrogance. I could just think, well, I'll just put down a quick 10K in my lunch break and then go back to work. And I just didn't take the appropriate steps to do that. Yeah, my warm-up wasn't great because I was in a hurry because I was trying to fit it in between clients and my mind was kind of elsewhere. It was kind of on an autopilot. So I think just taking my body for granted because it's, it's always been able to do those things. So, um, you know, it's it's a, it's a wake-up call. And I was definitely, there are periods in the injury where I've been down, but there's also like just loads of other things to work on. Like my core's a lot stronger now. Um, you know, my strict press is stronger. My front squat's stronger. My 2K row time's stronger. My ski erg 1K time is stronger. You know, like, before I was pulling like a 3.30 and feeling like on the ski erg and feeling like I'm gassed. Now I'm thinking like I'll be able to put down a 3.40 in a race and feel like, okay, I can carry on running. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm hoping for because I was sort of putting down four minutes and trying not to blow up. And that's still being maybe the case when I come back. I'll be probably extra cautious. But I know that there's like a capacity there. So it's just, you know, injuries give you opportunities, right? If you sort of really dial into it. Um, yeah. But it's tough to get your head around with there when they're repetitive. Um, but yeah, I've enjoyed the kind of, okay, high rocks is great and I love it and it's fun. And, but this gives me a different window to concentrate on. But um, yeah, I've, I'm still I'm still skipping at the moment. I'm still uh, doing some like light bounding work and I'm just trying to build it gradually and, and yeah, there'll, but there will be a, have to be a time where the training wheels come off, and I have to just start running. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to that point with football actually. Like, I tore my ligaments one year, and then like I played afterwards. But it it becomes like psychological, a, a big element of it in the end. And like your heart weren't in it, my heart weren't in a lot of the tackles after that. And you just say, yeah, oh, what's, what's what's the point? You know, and it's probably fine, but I don't want to risk playing football ever again. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I stopped playing football at thirty. And I've I've jumped into a, like three or four games since, and I don't really regret it because football is so, um, you know, it's so uh, unilateral. You just you're always using one side of your body, you know, one to balance on, one to strike the ball, and that's a repetitive nature that you don't really need when you're trying to run, mm. you know. And I played a lot of tennis as well as a kid, so my right side has always been a lot more powerful than my left, but my left side has always been more stable. So when you're running, you need to create that dual stability and mobility on both sides to be optimal and then reduce the chance of injury so it's a puzzle uh, and one that i kind of like um fixing for other people and fixing myself um so it's it's, it's a challenge you know like i said i think i think it came out the other day i've done 14 14 000 hours of personal training wow you know so it's like a lot of experience of seeing how bodies move and seeing what's possible and you know, there's an optimal way to see how someone squats and lunges. And and that's why we like watching sports on TV because athletes make movement look effortless. Mm-hmm. And and that's why they're supreme. And but if you take that, you know, all the way back to high rocks, is there's an efficiency how to do the burpees and the lunges, and there's an efficiency how to be on the skier and um and the rowing machine and even and warbles, it's a flow. So when your mechanics are, are optimal then you'll put down a faster time and you'll be a better athlete. If you have suboptimal mechanics, then it's going to hurt, <laughs> you know, and your your rate of injury increases. 
So, so what are what are some common mistakes that you think people make when when training for high rocks? Um, too many mixed modality sessions. So you're just kind of like looking at the eight stations and blending them together, and then going right. We'll do a thirty calorie row. We'll do thirty meters of burpee broad jumps, and we'll do thirty meters of walking lunges, and we'll do that times five. And that's not a bad session. It's gonna you know it's gonna be it's gonna be tough for some people, right? Um, but it's like, what do you want to get out of it? What are you trying to recreate? And how many times are you going to do that session? Is it just a one-off? And it's just basically like an action plan. People are like, they're always focused on today's session, but they should kind of look at it throughout a month, you know, in a six, seven, eight week period. And you should almost write down 12 different sessions that are different, that one is going to be like, you know, write down an anaerobic session, write down two or three aerobic sessions, write down two or three low impact sessions for like recovery or if you can't run or whatever happens, then look at two or three different strength sessions. And then you can put them across your diary and see how you can blend them based on your lifestyle and time available. And as we know, it's all about adaptation. So if you can get adapted to the right stimulus, then you get stronger and you get quicker. Most people aren't thinking about adaptation they're just thinking about kind of getting through it no matter what and that shouldn't be your goal you need to kind of you know timings are important rest periods are important um repetitive movement is, is important heart rate is important and so i think just people are throwing mud to the wall and that's kind of fine but like i said to you at the beginning it's a repetitive standardized course so you should be getting better if you're redoing the same events you know with, with that goal to get better you should be if you're not getting better then it's coming down to your training or lifestyle and it's difficult to sometimes say that about yourself if you're coaching yourself maybe it's just like sleep maybe the kids are up at four in the morning maybe you didn't eat great maybe there was traffic on the way down maybe it's nerves there's so many reasons right but maybe sometimes it is just your training isn't progressively overloading you and you're not adapting. Maybe it's just too much of the same thing that you like doing. Mm. And so you have to be critical of your own data and analyze it and just be like, well, do you know what? I'm terrible at this. And my transitions are awful. I was spending too long. You know, I look at, I tell a joke when I, when I read people's rock zone times, you know, I sort of say, if it's over four minutes, you must have stopped and had some lunch in there. <laughs> you know, <'cause, laughs> like, you know, the rock zone is this like, you know, it's like this safe space where you're like, okay, I've got a little break, you know, like, and you, you, you leave a station, you're like, oh, I might just stroll out there, get some water. When you're in the pros, you probably, you know, are running 1.1 kilometer intervals anyway, because you're looking at it going, well, I'm not going to slow down in the rock zone. I'm looking to speed up. Yeah. You know, when you, when you leave the station, it's like, right. And, and if you're somewhere in between, you've just got to know that getting back out on the lap course it's like a conveyor belt that pulls you round. You might as well be walking around the outside than walking through the rock zone. Do you know what I mean? Because you're yeah, sort yeah. of like, it's a wave of energy pushing you round. So if you can get in the headset, in the headspace of like, right, get out of the fucking rock zone quickly, <laughs> then you're good because, you know, then you're already on your lap pace already. So that's one of the, you know, the mindset approaches that I think people need to have. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I noticed it at the London event just gone probably more than ever, actually. Like when you got into the rock zone, and you had that like hard turn and people kept stopping in front of me. I was like, yeah. Have you, have you not read my blog? <laughs> That's it. That was a horrible, like double U bend, wasn't it? You were running yeah. in immediately yeah. doing a double back and then you were running out and doing a double back. So that, that doesn't equate to like, if you're a pro athlete looking to try and break an hour, you probably look at it going, oh, that's annoying. Yeah. Because that's time of deacceleration and reacceleration that you, you know, that's unaccounted. And you do that eight times, that's 45 seconds, <laughs> you know, yeah. easy. So yeah. courses that are fast kind of flow and aren't busy, you know, and have less people on them, right? So, you know, that's, you know, I don't think, you know, there's been a lot of um, like uh, discussion and kind of debate about, different courses and different sleds and different carpet and all the variables about, you know, high rocks. If you look at it from their point of view, if you're trying to recreate 
a standardized race like a marathon or an Ironman, each course is different, mm -hmm. but the goal is the same. And so that makes sense. And we've all just got to kind of like accept that. And sometimes, you know, it's a, it's a new, relatively new company, so it's never going to be perfect. I mean, from now on, I think they've sorted the sleds and the carpet and everything, and, and it's all golden. But there's always that sport. You can't, there's not 100% variable control available. You're just going to, you know, okay, my sled got stuck. Okay, like, it's super busy today. Okay, there's water down in the rock zone. I slipped. Do you know what I mean? This is kind of like, these are the minor details that, you know, you need to think about. So mm -hmm. that's part of sport, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I I've, I heard you talk on uh, the UK HXR podcast, or you, you sort of briefly mentioned it about um, uh, people people's pacing in the race and how you you try and work with your clients before to work out where their like lactate threshold is on on each of the stations and the runs and and so on. Can you? Can you talk about that some more? Do you are you testing that with clients in training before before an event so that they know how to pace each element of the race? Yeah, there's variable ways to test for it, right? You can basically create like uh, you know negative splits. You know, for someone you can literally say like run, go out for a twenty minute run, start. You can do it by RPE scale, rate of perceived exertion, and you can kind of go start at a five, and each kilometer. I want you to go up a full number based on how you perceive your own effort. And that's obviously going to get to a point where they're going to go, right, that's where I want them to say, I want you to mark where you felt the lactate start to come into your legs. And I can see it on a data graph of like where the pace decreases. So if I've asked them to increase the pace and I know kind of that's where the lactate turn is, you know, and that's like kind of like that's their maximum. And so, you know, if you're trying to, train for a better lactate threshold and then you kind of need to kind of just focus on those intervals again and again just before the lactate turn so you obviously need a wider base and there's always time for zone one and zone two training that's great um but really the the the, the key to it is kind of dipping in and out of that zone four that turning point before you red line and going right how long can i maintain this threshold before I'm going south again in my splits. And yeah, I test with different people based on what they've got. There's not just one test for it, right? Um, there's a running test because you develop lactate differently when you run than when you're on a ski erg. Mm -hmm. um, on the sleds, obviously, they're going to bring it on a lot faster. The heavier the component, the more lactate you're going to generate. So just basically, if they've done a high rocks before, I'll have a look at their data and be like, right, okay, your sled time is you know, let's say a minute below the average or it's in, you know, it's in the lower percentile of everybody else. I look at that and be like, right. So we work on transitions in and out of the sleds, you know, and, and just even pushing a light sled regularly more often just so they can become accustomed to that feeling in their legs isn't necessarily going to be like, right, I've made them bulletproof and I've improved their lactate threshold overall, but specifically I've improved it on the sled. So that in turn can give them more experience in how it feels upon entering the sled and upon leaving the sled. And it's just experience. So, you know, we dial in uh, a heart rate, you know, or a turn where they develop lack rate, uh, lactate so that they can get better. Um, it's pretty simple, um, but it's very effective because if someone's training with me, let's say they're on six days a week, like some really good athletes are trained, then I've got, time to load the week so they're going to feel completely different on tuesday to saturday so by the time they get to friday and saturday we're doing mixed modality sessions and they've had the week build through like steady state some um, pre-fatigued running sessions they've had some strength in there now they've got to put it all together and so i can sort of see them get better or worse each week based on what i've given them and yeah, we obviously talk to my clients as well about it. Say like, how did you feel? I can see, you know, you're tanked after 10 minutes. Do you, I think you went off too quick. You know, if, if I've got the splits available, um, some people don't, some people are just doing it with a stopwatch. And so I have to go by RPE scale, but yeah, it really is just a, it's a conversation and a relationship with the, with the client. So 
it's hard to take on too many clients online because it's just too many phone calls. Like most evenings, I'm on the phone for a couple of hours with clients or, you know, I'm texting them or I'm updating the the, um, the app that I use to be like, look, what's going on here? How do you feel? Or just noting their feedback, you know? So it's a, it's a constant upkeep of information and data, but, you yeah. know, it's part of the job, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, if we if we shift gears a little bit, I know you you mentioned like you've spent a lot of time with Tom and and Hunter. Um, what's uh, what do you feel like makes them different to 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 your average person who is training hard and and so on? And maybe it's an element of genetics and history and everything like that. But is there any other elements you think it applies? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Um, I've always said that the best athletes are the people with the best attitudes, and I mean that in the sense I I, I class myself in that category because any time a coach has told me to done something, I've never questioned it. Mm-hmm. And sport in general is obviously a, you know there's so many opinions, and everyone's got opinion on the football at the moment about who should play. And but when you're doing in a sport like high rocks. Sometimes it's not really about opinions. Sometimes it's about data and facts. And having trained with Hunter and Tom and seeing the level of intensity, it's just that raw kind of like, this is what we're doing. There's no like procrastination before. There's no like, oh, like, what are we going to do? How should we do it? It's like ready in five. Uh, we're going to do an hour and a half run, then we can come back, we'll grab some lunch, and then we'll hit the weight room. And it's just that simple, you know, that simplification of like what they're going to do with their day. And obviously Hunter's a full-time athlete so that he can prepare his day accordingly. But, you know, he, he'll, he you know, if anyone's on one of his programs, they'll see the, the intensity of that. And so when you're training at a much higher intensity, you're going to yield a much better result. And if you can kind of align the rest of your lifestyle to prepare for that intensity, then you'll see that, training is is great and but recovery is really important and i guess with with hunter obviously full-time athlete with tom it's a little bit more special in the fact that he's still working a big job and you know family and stuff and hopefully mixing up loads of pots of builder (laughs) (laughs) and shipping them (laughs) but like you know for tom it's different you know tom and dina that yeah they got you know they got a lot of other stuff going on. So they've got that background of endurance anyway. They both, they both used to do a lot of like Ironman and endurance sports. But yeah, it's they're like, they don't procrastinate. They love it. So you have to love that pain. You have to love that suffering, knowing that you can overcome it and know you can get better. And that competitive spirit, like Hunter's probably the, the most competitive person I've ever met. And I'm very competitive, but he'll do it with anything. You know, like, and it's just skin in the game. You know, all of a sudden it's like, right, max pull-ups. You know, I did, he made me do 27 wide pull-ups by like, coming out of freezing lake. And then I actually thought, you know what, like 27, that's not bad. He just did 28 and he was, he was struggling on like 25. You know, he was like, I saw him like just like hanging on. And I was thinking, I think I've got him here. No, he just sort of held on and just held on the bar <laughs> and then just pulled out another three. So I think yeah it's just that like if there's a plan he's sticking to that plan you know and the same thing with tom they just go right well that's what we're doing today let's let's get on with it and i notice when i coach people if i write something on the board that we're doing they look at it almost like with like a fear and trepidation of like how that's going to feel and that's that's an attitude difference there if you just go look at it and go right i'm gonna figure that out on the fly maybe don't go off too quickly then you're going to be okay. If you look at that going, oh God, I want to, I don't want to suffer. Then you're, you're not going to get that adaptation. Yeah. You know, and if you're always doing a 45 minute class in a gym somewhere, your body's kind of predisposed now to 45 minutes of exercise. So you kind of know what's coming. And you've, like I said, you've always got to push the boat out a little further. The better you get, the harder it gets. You just get more, you know, you just you know evolve at getting better at it, so to speak. It's not to say it's not difficult, it's extremely difficult. But you, you know, the, the better athletes become more obsessed about recovery, nutrition, hydration. Everything is kind of like geared towards the next one and the next one and the next one. 
and it's fascinating to see and it's a, you know it's good to be around um but it's intense you know um there's no doubt about it like i can only hang out with hunter for so long before i'm like i need to go lie down bro <laughs> like, <laughs> he's like uh i've been up to this before about him he's like uh he's like a two-year-old child you know i love him but he's like spins around all this energy and then eats something and falls asleep <laughs> and then wakes up and it's all it's all the same again you know and you know the, the two-year-old you know um, metaphor is like you know yeah he's working out he's got all this energy and it's it's crazy you know when i got to his in california like day one i'm running down the side of a mountain wading through rivers up to my waist to get to the beach and then i'm running back up i'm thinking i don't even know the way back it's just expected for me to figure it out there's no like yo make sure you go this way and go that way like he took off and did his training session and i'm doing mine except i have no idea where i'm going <laughs> and it's snake and it's snake season because it's really hot so now i'm running through like you know essentially like these massive canyons in malibu thinking about snakes whilst i've forgotten all about threshold and everything i've just described to you i'm just now blowing out my ass running up the side of a mountain dying so i'm just glad to make it back but survival survival <laughs> but because the rest of the day i was on the sofa i was eating i was recovering and then i was doing my second session we were doing you know six seven hours of pars you know hitting the weights room i was like oh and i was waking up and i was like i'm okay you know it's just just that again and i think when you are a full-time athlete you're obviously level of intensity. You've got so much more tolerance for it than others, you know. So it's it's super powerful, really. Um, I suspect as well that so like being around that attitude, right? If you're if you're around someone who's like, oh, I'm tired and everything, it can rub off onto you. But if you're like around people that are just like ready to go again, no judgment, etc., like it, it, it rubs off on you as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, like I came back from um, hunters in yeah, like early April. And I had a deload and then I came out the deload and I was just going around the gym, just like challenging just different trainers, <laughs> trainers and members. I was just like, dude, I'm going to rip your head off here. <laughs> you know, like, let's go, let's go max ski erg. Right. So we'll do seven minutes, max ski erg. Right. And whatever's left of, um, sorry, we're doing 1.5 K whatever's left of like nine minutes. Right. We're going to go, um, 10 burpee box jumps. Uh, we're going to do 20 war balls like as many times as we can in that remainder. It's just like a sickening workout that you just, you don't even know your name. And I was just like doing that and I was going to get something to eat. And then I was like, right, let's do a different one. And I was getting another trainer and dragging him into it. And it, they're just like beating other people just gave me more confidence of like, yeah, I'm special. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's not really what's happening, but it's that same you know, attitude that I can see with Hunter, where Hunter drags people to his cabin, just <laughs> slaps them around for a week. They leave in a world of her, and Hunter's there, just like, see, like, bitch, you can't hang with me. You know, <laughs> he'll say something ridiculous. You know, but yeah, he brings out a different intensity in me, so that's why it's you know it's great to train with. I think, you know, I never ask anybody. I never work out before midday ever, ever. So he comes to London. And I'm up, I'm like, I'll train a client. He came to my gym and at eight o'clock I'm doing a hundred kilo split squats, five by five. And I'm just like, I haven't, you know, it wasn't great because I'd barely warmed up enough to sort of do that. And then I'm just doing his workout and I'm thinking, this actually doesn't feel too bad. You know, so he really does like, you know, but that's, that's, that's down to a lot of different variables, right? Like I, I know I'm not, the best athlete in the world but i've trained for a long time in the right way so that i've got some sort of pedigree that allows me to sort of do that but you know it's it's definitely like if you train with other people that are better than yourself you get better mm -hmm. um and i think hunter's done that as well with other people like he has a long-standing rival with a couple of different athletes and he's always kind of gone you know like he's always like put an arrow you know or put a, put a marker on their backs and so he's gonna be like right i've got to beat you and that, that's what drives him, you know? So that's why he's that character we kind of love as well, because he sort of goes out and does what he's going to do. Um, and that's what he's doing 
you know, with with Builder and, and and that now is that you know he's got a great product, and he knows that like regardless of what your allegiance is with pre workouts and and nutrition and all that, he understands that like this is a drink that helped him. So he's obviously going to go into business and promote it. And so that's why it's also exciting to be a part of because we've, we've got a great supplement that works and it's perfect for like high rocks and, and other stuff. But it just, it's one of the same thing, you know, like he's thought about it and he's looked at the science and gone, what are the ingredients I need to develop a great product that's not necessary on the market? And he's come up with it. So yeah, that's the attitude of, of Hunter. It's, 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 it's a, uh, it's probably like one of that. It's like that um, that ride at Orton Towers, Nemesis. You just holding on though. That, that's kind of how I see it. Like I'm about to go off and drop, and I'm but I'm holding on. Um, and that's basically how it works with Hunter. And you can only kind of hang out with him if you can hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that, what, what what you said about uh, both of them, like not not judging the workout in advance and so on. But like, I spoke with uh, Rich Ryan as well, and I, it was more about in the race and when you're like really suffering and uh, what he thinks about and he sort of had just said like there's there's no judgment about it he's just like he's not he's not thinking oh like this is terrible he's just like no judgment so i I suspect like that applies to tom and hunter as well not just before the session but like mid-session when you are really suffering the uh how you think about that suffering probably has a huge impact on your performance right 100 percent. that voice in your head that says this hurts i want to stop they don't listen to that voice that's not even a voice that comes up because they're so conditioned to staying positive about the workout or about the race that they're doing that time passes where they haven't dipped into that negative mindset and then before they know it another stage of the race has come where you can kind of comprehend how much time and effort is left to get through Mm -hmm. And it's like sports day. Everyone's got like a little left in the tank for that home sprint. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You can be like, I've only got this left. Go, let's get it done. And the better athlete that you are, the longer you can sprint for. So, you know, whether it's from the lunges onwards, that last lap, those last few laps hurt everybody. But if you're a world championship athlete and someone says to you, all I've got to do is run a kilometer and do a hundred wall balls and I'm world champion. That's a piece of cake. You know, that's, seven minutes of suffering it's not a problem that's a whole brand new workout in their head mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that mentality is, is is crucial for sure but it takes time to develop it you have to have confidence from your training you have to see your own progressions you have to see your own um you know body evolve to that level you know and it's not not for everybody you know i mean definitely i've done some workouts where i'm, I'm looking at it going i don't want to do that again you know i i feel that way about 2k row test I just hate it. Mm-hmm. it. Takes me like half an hour to like think about it. Then another half hour to warm up. And then I'll sort of begrudgingly do it. And after I get to about 750 meters every time, I feel like I just turned it off <laughs> just <to do> it <laughs> for another day. <laughs> so, but it's important. And if I just think if I can just galvanize that feeling and just kind of be okay with it, then you become adapted to it. And that's all it is. It's a feeling. So if you don't take it too personally, then you get better at it. If you take it really personally, like this pain is being done to me, then yeah, you're probably going to quit every time. If you think this is for the greater good, I'm going to get better if I do this regularly, then you will. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Um, uh, have you got, have you got a, a few minutes for a few more questions? Or? Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Um, can we, can, we talked about training, but can we, can we talk about some nutrition, uh, side of things do, do you um let's talk about mid-race nutrition do you do you recommend your clients take anything mid-race um i sort of talk about it throughout training and i kind of sort of see when we do some like half simulations and when we do some longer sessions you know i basically talk about like having full glycogen stores before a big training session um, I need about 14, 1500 calories of food in my body before I do a workout. So that's okay if the workout's at lunchtime. I'll put even more in my body if I'm doing a race in the evening. It's just a little bit harder to judge because of nerves and anxiety and stuff. But when you're doing a race, you kind of need that approach that it's like 
it's like two classes, two gym classes back to back, the two sets of 45 minutes. If you're like failing or feeling like weak at the halfway stage, maybe like after the burpees or on, on the rower, then maybe you didn't have enough food or glycogen stores in your muscle. So that's kind of, you know, that could be the problem. But if they've eaten, then it probably isn't that. What it's more likely to be is the environment and the anxiety maybe causing dehydration and that, you know, maybe they've been in the arena three, four hours before they race so that actually if you look at your resting heart rate when it goes into the arena, it literally jumps about 40 beats a minute. So you're walking around at 80, now you're in the arena watching your friend and it, like I said, everything's hormonal driven. So your, bur- your body doesn't really know the difference between doing a burpee yourself and watching someone else do it because you're involved you're there in that space watching it hence why sport is exciting but hormonally you're firing off the same cortisol and adrenaline going yeah this is great not 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 realizing that's going to be you in two hours and you know so that whole preparation comes into it and you need to obviously be careful but i think hydration is honestly the big the biggest thing and that's obviously again while we've you know, hunters come out with the hydration supplement is because it's a common mistake for anybody to make. Like most people are dehydrated walking around, not working out. You know, I never see people drink water in the street. I never see people, you know, have a bottle of water with their coffee. It's just, you know, culturally, we're not uh, accustomed to knowing how important these things are. And when, when, when you say hydration to people, they say, oh, but I've had loads of water. And thinking that that's solving the issue when water and hydration are, literally have nothing to do with the other one in the sense of like, you're just going to pee more, you know, you're going to dispel more water from your body. But when you have salts and potassium and calcium, magnesium, then you're going to hold water, and have that retention of salt with the salt. And now your body can deliver nutrients to the muscle belly faster. That's hydration. And that's why we all feel so awful if we have a night out the next day because you become dehydrated. So in the sporting performance, it affects it like 1% dehydration is 20% performance drop. So you know, that's like your personal PB for high rocks being like, let's say it's an hour. Now you're doing like, <laughs> now you're doing like an hour 15 just because you didn't get the right amount of hydration in. And if you're an hour 15 guy, now you do like an hour 25. So it's very obvious, but it's not something that's practiced by everybody. But hydration is like the easiest thing to tick if you're trying to get better at endurance sports. But it's habitual drinking in the morning. Obviously, I have just, just water, but then we use Builder a lot just before and during workouts. Um Caffeine is a mild diuretic, so it's not like it causes dehydration, but what it does is forces the kidneys to dispel more urea so that you're actually excreting more fluids from the body, which is the opposite of what you want. So that's very subtle, but caffeine is great for shorter workouts and it can be great for endurance, but a few hours before, and then you kind of have to rehydrate to get the best out of it. And I think, again, it's like, Culturally, it's just not the dumb thing in the UK. Like there's coffee shops everywhere, but the really good coffee shops, they give you some water because they know that like you're going to be thirsty after this. Whereas when you buy a pre-workout, people go, I don't have any water. <laughs> it's like they just, they just have their pre-workout. But it's the same thing as the coffee. So, you know, you gotta you got to be careful. I think it's probably a, a consideration as well with with high rocks, like the ca- caffeine before a high rocks when you're amped up and, you know, you said anyway, you walk in, you're 40 beats per minute higher anyway. Oh. You, you don't need caffeine right before that. So. Yeah. If you're new and you're listening to this and you've got a high rocks coming up and you're always on the pre-workout, just know that, that, that what that's going to do to your body, that's going to force more cortisol, more adrenaline, and that's going to bring on lactate faster it's not gonna it's not a lactate buffer because you're so you know you're over you're you know your your body is just running on cortisol and you're excited to run it just makes it harder to hold back 
which is the skill of Hyrox, is not going out too quickly. It just makes that whole anxiety feeling of like, oh, panic. And then, oh, I'm going to run, I'm going to compete against this guy or I'm going to compete against this girl. You're just going to be like, I need to quickly you know, catch them up. When you don't have caffeine in your system, you're just a bit more calmer and you can kind of just be a little bit more holistic with how your body's feeling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are different things to kind of, you know, um, get you going like nitric oxide and beta alanine. They work pretty well. Um, because they create more blood to the blood vessels. You know, they create a faster flow. And that in turn gives you kind of like a feeling of like more energy and hypervigilant. Um, beta alanine only works if you load it for about four, five, six weeks. It doesn't work as a one-off. It kind of just makes your face tingle. But if you load it appropriately, then you kind of bypass the regular tingles and you get a good feeling from it. But um yeah, nutrition is is key with something like high rocks. It's the, it's the, probably the difference between like you know if you're a really good athlete and you're doing 70 minutes, you know, let's say you get your nutrition horribly wrong, you run in 75, you get it right, you now run in 66, 67. It's that it's that important. So it's probably like an 8 minute, 10 minute swing just yeah. on the day. So yeah. yeah. All right. Um I put out on, on my stories for any questions for you. And to oh, be yeah. fair, I should have asked these when we were talking about the training a little, a little bit more, but um, we had a couple come in. One was uh, what are your three favorite exercises that are not part of a high rocks race that have a, had the biggest impact on the race itself. Um, deficit deadlift. Um, that's really good for sled pulls. Just, I put myself on a, couple of plates pretty high up and just work the hamstrings, work the glutes and work the lower back. Um, probably uh, front rack kettlebell split lunges or walking lunges, kind of mix it up between both. And probably I always play with like a sandbag because a sandbag is, is testing your grip. You can carry it so it's harder to breathe. You can squat with it. You can throw it over your shoulder. You can lunge with it. It's just a bit of kit that I kind of just, it's so honest, so simple. <laughs> and it's just, there's just no escape. So, you know, that's definitely really good. I also do love a, a weight vest. So if you suck at running, but you've got good mechanics, get a weight vest, you know, and just start doing your slow runs in it. Then you can take it off and you just, you can feel the difference. Um, if you've got bad mechanics, don't put a weight vest on. <laughs> you're just gonna, <laughs> yeah. You just increase the risk of injury. Yeah. But yeah, that's probably my favourite. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah. And then someone asked about. Um, I guess it's. I guess the question really is about how how your running training might progress throughout a season. So, if you, if you think about like June, where there's no immediate races, what might that three month period look like versus intra season running training? Um, in that off season of high rocks, I guess you've got a chance to rebuild, right, and kind of go back to the drawing board. So the first thing you should do is look at your data, look at your weaknesses. So, and if it's running based, then maybe running efficiency. So it could be technical. Maybe you're an overstrider. Maybe you're a heavy foot lander. Um, so I would, you can see a specialist and just kind of tidy up your your gait mechanics and your stride length because that in itself without doing any effort is going to improve your time if you have a good like foot under hip landing motion then you're much more like a wheel and you propel yourself forward faster if you overstride obviously the the quadriceps act like brakes and they deaccelerate you they also put a lot more pressure through the hip therefore causing knee pain ankle pain because of ground force reaction so running in efficiency is just obviously the, the best way. Um, then with like programming, obviously like let's say intervals, because we know intervals are just tried and trusted. I wouldn't necessarily think about increasing your pace. I would think, you know, per set. Um, I like a six minute and wrap. You run a kilometer in six minutes, you rest the remainder. And then you can just reduce that rest period. So now it's 5.45, now it's 5.30. And you're now forcing yourself to sustain a higher heart, heart rate throughout your 
kilometer intervals you know that's a real simple way to get better um hill sprints they're just tried and trusted again obviously running up something is always going to feel a lot harder than running flat so if you if the park near you's got like a, a nice big hill you can do some repeats and you pick a pace that you can kind of maintain to the top let's say it's a two minutes to the top um you can kind of jog walk back down and then as you get better you can either pre-fatigue it or you can reduce the rest period so you can run up and run down then rest at the bottom a little less each time um or you can do switch back so you run all the way to the top run halfway down it then run back up again then all the way back down there's there's different ways um and you can play with that carefully in a progressive overload manner but remember you're only thinking about this for a six to eight week block you know you don't you don't want to be doing hill sprints like let's say you've just done uh, london and now you've got two months till manchester you gotta be doing your hill sprints kind of in the first couple of weeks of uh december you don't want to be doing them january 14th you know what i mean like it's there's just too much fatigue there and not enough time to recover so you want to get them in this side of Christmas. So mm-hmm. um, I guess that would be the the biggest thing, though, those those three things. Yeah. Um, reduce the rest periods. Um, but it depends where you are as an athlete. You know, it depends what stage of the game you're at. You know, uh, general prepared, ge- general physical preparedness is like 101 of strength and conditioning. You know, you run, you jump, you carry. You know, you, you you move things from A to B, you squat, you press. You do these things more often, you'll be a better athlete, you know. So, but, but people just do what they like. Just do the things you're bad at more regularly. You'll, you'll be a better athlete. That's the simple, simplest way. Um, stop going to your 45-minute classes um, and learn to train by yourself for longer. You know, most people don't know the difference between a hinge and a squat. Most people have terrible mechanics for pull-ups and for pressing just because, like, the way we sit at desks is internally rotated shoulders. And so when we press over our head, we use our traps as a primary muscle. And really, when you're pressing, you should press from the scapula and the lower part of the traps, like trap three raises, they're called. And, you know, you should tuck it, you know, you should have your elbow tucked in and, you know, your lats should kind of be the base to hold something overhead. And most people, if they've ever had a shoulder injury, like frozen shoulder, rotator cuff injury, that that would be apparent from their pushing and pulling mechanics. And if you want to get better at the sleds, then your pushing and pulling mechanics are really important. So it will probably come down to how your shoulder blades open and close um and then in the front squat you know people back squat but they don't front squat and when you're doing 100 wall balls you need a strong core to not let the when you catch the ball you don't want it to pull you over right into a hinge or into like a bow position you see a lot of a lot of time people can't reach the depth of you know not you know for their for their judge to give them a rep so they're getting no rep because they don't have the mobility and the mechanics to actually make that squat flow so mobility for some people, especially, uh, you know, guys our age, you know, if you played football and rugby and then you've had a bit of time off and you're getting back into this, those adductors and those hip flexors are going to be awfully tight and probably awfully weak. So if you've got a you know weakness in your mo- you know, in the mobility, you need to fix it because it, it comes out a rep 35 on those walls yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. and, and now you're suffering. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd say those things really. Um, okay all right thank you um any question you wish i'd asked that i wish you had asked yeah um no i mean i think it's a really good podcast i think what you're doing is is really good for the sport i think it highlights the importance of like data analytics and kind of all the small things that maybe we don't think about i think it's a really entertaining channel as well that you're putting out there and you you're speaking to different athletes and you're bringing the fitness community together so it's it's all super positive what you're doing, Greg. It's it's, it's big and you know, I really appreciate it. And I think people find your posts like funny and entertaining and, you know, they're kind of like, oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. And it kind of, it creates conversation. It creates debate, which is important. Um, you know, we're all, we're all adults. So we're not, it's not like political, but 
with sport there's a lot of passion behind it but i still think it's always important to talk about these things because the the sport and the betterment of the sport can always always learn from the people that are participating so then you're actually really like your your relationship with high rocks is really important because you're a good communicator for them but then you're also bringing feedback from people racing and it becomes now like, oh yeah, well look, look at the data. Like the sleds are faster in Madrid, and they are heavier in the USA. And what's going on here, you know? And it, it holds them accountable, which is important because they're not perfect, but they strive to be. And with with people like yourself, it's 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 really important that you have that accountability. And you know, I've listened to some of your podcasts as well, and you know, it's fun. You know, it's good. It's good. Thank you, mate. mate. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. No worries. Um. Where should people go if they're interested in your coaching, your builder? Where should they go? Um, so builderinternational.com. Um, that's that's the first part. For that, the coaching, you can find me on Instagram or georgeedwardstraining.com. Uh, yeah, just reach out to me. Um, you know, I, I'll get back to as many people as I can. Um, I think with coaching, the biggest thing you want to ask yourself is, you know, not do I need a coach? Do I want a coach? is just kind of like are you ready for a coach most people don't understand that like it's a commitment you know like we're not um you know we're not magic magic weavers you know we can't just turn you from like a 90 minute runner into an hour runner um but you know feedback is important amongst coaches and also amongst the athlete and coaches so it's a relationship where you know you basically you have someone on your side who's thinking about your body and your performance and how to make you better whilst you're not working out. And so that's something that I think is valuable. And that's why I have a coach myself. And that's why, um, you know, I think I bring value to my clients, but yeah, you have to think, am I actually ready for it? Because, you know, I've previously taken on people that are like, I want to do this. I'm ready for it. And then four or five weeks, they're like, Oh, I've got this thing. I've got this wedding. And now I'm out of the country for a week and i can't get to the gym and actually i don't have this and that's fine but you've got to you've got to go through all that crap before you know <laughs> so that you can be like okay this is what i want to do and then you'll get the most out of a coach um mm-hmm. if you not everybody needs a coach not everybody can afford a coach and it's not a priority but then think about the reason why you're doing high rocks or your or your event and what it means to you and then you can self-motivate by kind of journaling that story a little bit to see if it pans out how you thought it was going to pan out. And then you need to be mature enough and critical enough to look at it and go, hmm, that didn't pan out how I thought it was going to go. Maybe I should, you know, look and outsource a coach or somebody who's got experience in this, you know? So that's all it is, really. Like, if you were going to learn a language, you'd get a tutor. If you're going to learn guitar, you need guitar lessons. You want to get good at high rocks, you better get a high rocks coach because you know we're we're pretty experienced at this now. So it's that simple, really. Okay. All right. So George Edwards training, was that? George Edwards training.com. Yeah. And then you've got G E underscore training on Instagram. Um I'm not really on any other channels. I try to minimize it, you know, just uh social media is like I like it, but I don't want too many different platforms. I just try to keep it in one place. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I probably I probably should do more on YouTube and that, but I'm trying to spend less time on my phone, not not more time. So, yeah, GE underscore training on Instagram is the easiest way. Okay, all right, well, brilliant. Thank you for this. I appreciate it. It's really good chat. Um, I think yeah, it will help a lot of people. So, thank you. Thank you, mate. Appreciate your time. Right. Take care, everyone. Cheers, See ya.